<laughs> Sneezing is okay, don't cough. <laughs> oh, my professor. All right. So if um, here's the deal. If you want to, um, you should mute and you should probably mute your um, your video but if you want to ask a question unmute and unmute your video and everyone will be able to see you I'm uh, just messing around here, getting this thing uh, to work. Okay. Let me try sharing this screen and um, Okay, what do you guys see? Somebody tell me. You see your screen, Dr. McDonald. Okay, great. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes, we can. All right, good enough. <laughs> okay, let me go back to the beginning. Are we almost, we're almost ready to start, but let me, uh, let me wait a little. Let me get um, yeah. PowerPoint. There we go. I have to arrange all my windows. Okay, I think I got it. So um, uh, there's a, let me close the door so we don't have. Uh, okay, hang on one second. I got to talk to somebody. Hey, Daniel. So, oh, hey, do uh, you want to try cutting some of that stuff? I do. I'm teaching class right now, but here's the claw. Yeah, give me the claw. I can go and do some testing. Okay, so the inner claw is uh, this stuff. That's the inner claw, right? And then the outer claw is this. And I think she had all of the. Um, patterns cut for the women's size. Okay. So the 
priority is men's sizes right now, but you might try both of them yeah. just to make sure that it works. All right. Okay, buddy. Thanks a lot. No problem. See you. So I have an initiative underway um, where I went to a local seamstress and got a pattern online that uh, showed how to make um, homemade um, uh, uh, face masks. And so uh, I gave her the money to get going and uh, wanted her to make, you know, like a couple hundred, you know, men's sizes and women's sizes uh, because we can use them in the community here. And uh, so she got started, but it turns out it's really labor intensive to, to cut the patterns. So uh, I talked to uh, Daniel Dominguez here in the department, and he's going over to the innovation hub on campus. And we're gonna see if we can't use the laser cutter to cut out the patterns automatically, which would really speed everything up. So hopefully we can, we can crank out some, um, some uh, masks. Because apparently that's a, a big shortage is the supply of masks. All right, well, we're almost ready to start. And I wanted to say, you know, at the outset, I'm really grateful for you all showing up and hanging in there, supporting each other, supporting the whole class with your presence and with, you know, continuing to be interested and committed. Oh, he's doing, my first teacher didn't have the cam on. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you like it with a cam on? <gasps> I do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Um, all right. Well, I'll do that, and uh, hopefully that won't be too distracting. And you can see the slide, and then you can also, I guess, see. I'm not entirely sure what you all see, um, but uh, I see uh, uh, my face, and then a whole and then a list of you know the people who are participating. And um, looks like I got quite a few online here. I can't tell how many. But um, so, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So the, the, gui the gui guideline is that um, you should mute your, your video and mute your audio. But if you want to ask a question, uh, unmute your video and unmute your audio, and then everyone will be able to hear your question and, and see your, your, um, your, you know, see you. Uh, or you don't have to unmute your video if you, if you prefer not to, but that way you can ask questions. Okay, so what I wanna do um, this lecture is to go over the material um, that originally would have been scheduled for this time. This is uh, material taken based on the, what's in Garrison uh, chapter 16, uh, which is discussing marine communities. Now, uh, last week, or uh, I guess before spring break rather, uh, on the last Thursday of class, I didn't have an in-class presentation and because all that was canceled. And uh, I went ahead and recorded a version of the uh, lecture with uh, an audio overlay on each slide. And the problem with that method is that the, the file ends up being gigantic and it was really kind of awkward. Um, so that material is online. Um, I did get it up there and you can download it and listen to it. Uh, and there is gonna be a reading quiz over that. So, um, that material is, is present, but this is, I think, a better way to do this. Um, oh, you know what I need to do? I need to record. Let's see. How do I do that? Now I'm trying to figure out how to make sure I record this. It says it's recording. It says it's recording? Okay. Okay, yeah, I see it. Stop. Okay, pause recording. All right, great. All right, so we are recording. All right, so um, uh, so we'll get to that material in a second here. But first, I wanted to go over, you know, how we have to revise this course to adapt to the changing circumstances and to try to keep everybody on step. So this is the revised course, uh, course outline. So all the lectures will be presented as we're doing here via Zoom, and they'll be presented uh, 12.30 to 1.45, Tuesdays and Thursdays, which were the regularly scheduled class periods. And this is per the guidelines that come down from the president of the university, that we should continue to hold classes at the regularly scheduled, regularly scheduled times, um, except via Zoom. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, but I'm also recording these lectures, and. Um, 
the, the recording will be an MPEG-4 file, and I'll upload that to a YouTube, YouTube channel that I have. So you'll be able to view this later, or if for some reason you can't um, uh, get online uh, during the class period, you'll be able to join later and watch the, the video. Um, and I'm going to uh, 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 make up a new uh, uh, quiz, and you'll see there's a revision of how we're allocating points and what the assignments are going to be for the rest of the semester. So there'll be a 10-point quiz over the lecture material, and that'll be posted on Canvas, and you can do that. I guess I'll give you 48 hours to get that done. Um, and that's just to make sure everybody stays current. Now, the, the, the points and the questions will hopefully be, you know, pretty easy. I'm not going to try to challenge you too much, but I do want to verify that people have looked at the material, that they've learned the material, and are ready to uh, go ahead. So I also will upload the lecture notes slides, as we've done before. And so the lecture notes with the, the three uh, the slide thumbnails with the notes are online now, and um, you, I'll try to get them up a little bit sooner so that you can take notes as we went, if you'd like. Um, and I'm going to have to revise what's, what the assignments are, just because we can't keep functioning the way we have. There are going to be three more team homeworks that are going to be based on the readings or on material in the slides, and so I'll put those up. Um, and uh, the, the teams will be responsible for answering these questions as before. Um, I'm not sure if I'll continue. When will the lecture quizzes be due? The lecture quizzes will be due 48 hours after the lecture. So I'll, I'll prepare the lecture questions after I finish the lecture. Um, so I make sure that I cover that material and then I'll post those onto Canvas and I'll give you 48 hours from the time that they're posted to get them handed in. Who's that talking? My teacher. Oh. All right, well, I'll let you, are you on class right now or something? Yeah, but I don't even pay attention anyway. <laughs> okay. All right, so make sure you keep muted unless you're asking a question. All right, so that's the basic revision of the class, uh, some of the lecture material. Um, I've also revised the team projects. Now I sent around an announcement, but uh, after sending that announcement, I've, I've thought a little bit more about how I need to do this. Um, but the basic idea is that I'm gonna revise the team project. I, just, I don't know, but they will by next year. I just don't see how we can um, ask summer. people to, uh, somebody needs to mute their mic, please. You're gonna have to figure out something to do for work. Do you, well, nothing is open. Well, Make you sure you have the little mic muted. That, do you think that extended day for summer is going to be a thing? I, cool. I, I don't know, man. That's all so. new for everybody. So. I think it will be. Okay. Hey, uh, whoever, everybody check right now and make sure that you're muted. It needs to be open. Well, well you know know about your bright future scholarship money better than I do and what the guidelines are. Hey, Dr. McDonald. Yeah. Um, you can mute uh, Cole Brooks, I think, who is uh, not muted. Okay. Cole Brooks. Yeah, but then I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do with my... Okay, good. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right, I will keep this here. Okay, so the team projects are revised, and I'm not going to have you do a written report because uh, I just think that's too burdensome to have people trying to write remotely. Uh, but instead, you're going to have to prepare an extended abstract. So that's like a, uh, we'll say, a 750-word uh, uh, outline or, or uh, abstract of what you found and what you all thought. So everybody can contribute to that. And I will... Um, uh, and then in addition, you need a properly formatted bibliography of sources. And there's a minimum of 10 peer-reviewed sources and five popular press or web uh, uh, sources. I'd like to see a lot more than that, but uh, that's the minimum. And your major focus of the team uh, project will be preparing and then delivering a 20-minute power presentation, which we'll do during the last uh, class periods. The team presentations will be done uh, via Zoom. And just like the, the lectures uh, that I'm giving, I'll record those Zoom presentations and uh, we'll have a YouTube upload for that. 
Um, and in addition, I'd like each team to prepare five multiple choice or true false questions based on the material in their presentation. And that'll be, uh, they'll send those to me and I'll upload them for the class to answer on Canvas. And obviously each team will know the answers to their questions, um, but uh, overall everyone will have to uh, tune in to answer those. So that's an individual requirement uh, from the teams. So that everybody uh, has to individually answer the five multiple choice questions that each team prepares over their um, uh, uh, presentation. So here is a revised uh, course plan showing uh, the points for assignments. And this is uh, the assignment is in the, the left hand column. And what was uh, asked for by the old syllabus is in the middle uh, uh, left uh, column. What we've done so far is in the middle right column. And then what we have uh, to be completed is in the, uh, I'm sorry, the right hand column. Um, so uh, you can see that I've reduced, if you look down in the bottom here, I've reduced the total number of points from 950 to 890 points. So what remains are three um, uh, reading quizzes. Um, no, I guess I got this wrong. The three reading quizzes. So the reading quizzes are the same as the team homeworks. So that's going to be based on a revised total of uh, 860 points, not 890 points. Sorry, I got confused here. Um, the team project, instead of being worth um, uh, 350 points, that'll be worth 200 points total. Um, so uh, you've already earned uh, 75, uh, I mean, the, uh, there are, uh, you've already earned 75 points and there are 200 points remaining to be earned. Um, the uh, take home final will be worth 100 points, but the uh, in class final, of course, has been canceled. And then these lecture quizzes, which are the 10 point quizzes that all come up, they'll be worth a total of 100 points. So all the assignments combined will add up to um, 860 points, uh, not 890 as it shows in this slide, and I'll fix that. Uh, and then this is the way that I'm going to allocate grades. I've sort of um, really opened up the uh, number of points uh, allowed for different grades. So you can see that from 86 to 100 points, you'll get an A. From 71 to 85 points, you get a B. Uh, 56 to 70 points gets a C. And D is anything less than 56 points. I'm not going to flunk anybody who's still breathing at the end of this class. So uh, let me take a moment there. Are there any questions over this? And if you'd like me to go back to a slide, let me know. So questions, please. Brandon, you're recognized. Hey. Yeah. Brandon, go ahead. Uh, I just want to ask, so are we, are, is it just the plain letter grade, as in uh, A, B, C, D, or A minus, A plus, B minus, B plus, or are we just straight up doing letter grades? Uh, you know, I didn't think about pluses and minuses. I can do that. Um, um, so I can... Yeah, I haven't thought about how to allocate that, but I guess I can do that. I guess I can make B minus. I'm, I guess I'm, I won't do, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to do uh, uh, B minus or C minus or D minus, um, but if, if you get in the final five points of each category, I'll give you a plus, not for an A, of course, because there is no A plus. Awesome. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Sure. So no A minus, no B minus, no C minus, um, but in the top uh, five uh, uh, points for each category, you get a plus. So you can get a B plus or a C plus. All right, thank you. Other questions about the revised course plan? Uh, yes, Dr. McDonald. Um, so in the email you sent us earlier, um, you said that we had a true or false, we have to add a true or false uh, part to our presentations. Yes. So you um, expect us to um, see other people's presentations and then also answer these questions on Canvas? That's correct, yeah. So uh, I guess I should clarify that. Each team should prepare in advance 
five multiple choice or true false questions, send them to me. And then um, what I will do is uh, after the, the, the presentation, so there'll be three team presentations per lecture. And after the three team presentations, I will upload, there'll be an upload of um, uh, multiple choice questions, okay? So, okay. and there won't be any other um, uh, online questions to answer after the, during the, the, the final class periods when we have team presentations. So there's gonna be five uh, class periods when we have team presentations. Uh, and each of those class periods there'll be 15 points uh, that you have to get by answering the Canvas questions. All right, thank you. Okay. So yeah, so ahead of time you have to do that. Oh, and I, oh, I've kind of messed this up. I guess the, um, I'll have to revise the schedule and think about this, but there is still milestone three that's due um, so what I'd like you to do is to, is to have that milestone three due on the regular date. And uh, I will um, uh, have a Zoom meeting. I think I said this in the, in the uh, uh, Canvas announcement I sent out. I'll, I'll go ahead and um, have a Zoom meeting with each team to go over your presentation to help you with any questions that you have. Okay. So, uh, and I, I do apologize if there's sort of roughness and uncertainty, because this is kind of hard to figure out how to do all this exactly, but we'll get through it, and, you know, um, uh, that's how we, that's how we got to roll from here on out. Okay, any other questions about uh, grades, or how we're going to do this, or what kind of material we're going to cover? Dr. McDonald? Yeah? Can you review the format for the, um, for the... Uh, lecture quizzes? Okay, well the lecture quizzes will be the same as the homework quizzes that I've been, the team homework quizzes that I've been given out. Okay. So there'll, there'll be 10 questions which I will make up and they'll be, and I'll make them up after the lecture to make sure that I've covered that material. Um, and then um, um, they'll be on Canvas, you know, and there'll be choices and you just answer and, and click and then you get your points. And what is the due date for that as far as like if we have a lecture to how how soon do we need to complete that okay so after i finish this lecture i'll make up the questions and i'll put that on canvas and that'll be 45 i'm sorry 48 hours after um the after the the, the quiz goes up on canvas that you have to answer it perfect thank you okay other questions all right sounds good so um uh, here's another thing. If if any student has any difficulty, uh, if there's you know, and I'll send an on, announcement out there. You know, it looks like I've got about uh, 71 or 72 participants, which is not the full class. So I'm a little concerned that some people may not have online access um, or other issues like that. So if anybody's in that situation or the situation changes where they're not going to have online access. Um, get a hold of me and we'll try to work something out to where we can, you know, get you through the class. Okay. All right. Any other questions or concerns? And then we'll start with the regular lecture material. Okay, great. All right. So this is a lecture and we're talking about communities. Now in the last, um, uh, in the presentation that I gave or the lecture that I put online, we talked about different aspects of marine organisms. And in particular, I talked about um, the sort of primary production, secondary production, and consumers. And I hope everybody was able to follow along with that important point about um, the difference between terrestrial ecosystems and marine ecosystems in terms of primary production. And this is a this is kind of a key point, and this is one of the things that you know that really um, outlines really defines what a marine community is and that's the fact that um, the um, primary production on land the standing stock biomass or the total biomass of primary producers always greatly exceeds the biomass of the consumers and the predators primary consumers and, and the predators because uh, plant material 
uh, on land comprises vascular plants, multicellular plants with, in many cases, large amounts of biomass. Whereas in the ocean, the uh, biomass is, or the primary production is entirely microbial, well, almost entirely microbial if we don't count uh, the macroalgae. Um, and this. Um, All righty, where are we heading? And that, um, that uh, 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 primary production. So that means that there's very rapid I turnover, follow ye. turnover of the, um, somebody is not muted. That means that there's very rapid turnover of the um, oh, sorry. primary production. Okay, somebody is talking there. Okay, um, so that's a, a key feature of, um, of the uh, marine system. And an overview of this material is that the living organisms within any ecosystem um, uh, comprise a community. So um, we think about an ecosystem as having living components and non-living components and energetic throughput. But if we talk about just the living organisms, they together comprise a community. And the community consists of primary producers, primary consumers, and then predators at different levels, and then finally decomposers. Um, but if we take away, so the living, the community of, of living marine organisms is the living component of the ecosystem, minus the energy throughput and the non-living components. Um, and these uh, communities live, and each organism within the community um, lives within a habitat. So the habitat is formed uh, uh, partly by the non-living components. They, uh, in the case of the ocean, you know, where they find themselves, where the organisms situate themselves in the water column, or for organisms that live in the, on the, in the benthic layer, where they, um, how they make burrows or seek, uh, find other places to exist. Um, and the, uh, together, the place where each individual can uh, live is what's called a niche. So a niche is the uh, sort of the multidimensional um, uh, resources that define how a species can survive and persist over multiple generations. So, um, and within this niche is, is, uh, is uh, uh, constrained by the stresses that the environment put on individual species. And for the species, to be able to tolerate a range of these stresses. Um, individual species or different species compete and they compete for uh, resources. And the uh, upshot of this competition is the development of different species. So um, some organisms specialize on, on you know, one type of uh, prey or one type of uh, grazing uh, uh, organism and they compete with other organisms and the successful adaptation to being able to obtain some component of this um, is what um, defines, uh, um, uh, part of what defines their, their uh, niche. So, um, and then within each, within a, a community, each population has a carrying capacity. And that is the carrying capacity is the number of individuals that can persist um, uh, from generation to generation. And the uh, changes that occur um, uh, within communities, including a disturbance, succession, and stability, uh, are dynamic processes that shape the way the community can exist over time. Some examples of marine communities would include a rocky intertidal zone. So this is the, a rocky area on the, on the uh, shoreline of a, of a, uh, a coast. And um, uh, intertidal means that the, uh, that the habitat is inundated at high tide and uh, uh, dry or uh, sub-aqua uh, exposed to air during low tides. 
Um, another example would be a coral reef. This is also a coastal community, but typically coral reefs are um, uh, underwater most of the time. I guess some coral reefs, there may be some exposure um, of corals at, uh, at low tide, but typically coral reefs are entirely inundated. The pelagic ecosystem comprises the vast majority of the ocean volume. So pelagic, of course, means uh, free floating within or free moving within the marine environment. So the pelagic community can include organisms that mostly live in the upper porch portion of the water column, or some that live in the midwater, or many that migrate up and down between these two um, within the, the water column. Another example of marine community are benthic communities, and these are communities of organisms that live on the sea floor. Uh, beach, kelp uh, forests, either, these are other examples of marine communities, each with a set of primary producers, uh, consumers, uh, predators, and decomposers. So this is a general overview of what we're trying to look at when we think about marine communities. I have a so, question about um, the rocky okay. intertidal and coastal coral reefs. Sure, go ahead. Um, question about rocky intertidal and coastal. Can you identify yourself, please? Uh, Raquel Solara. Okay, Raquel. Um, can you, I thought, I think I misheard you, but I thought you were saying that coral reefs are an example of rocky intertidal, or are they just very similar? Because you're saying that the rocky intertidal uh, marine communities are exposed to air during low tides and that coral reefs can be exposed to um, air during low tides as well. Like what's the biggest difference between them? Well the rocky intertidal, um, you know, the entire range of the entire tidal range comprises the rocky intertidal. For a coral reef, it's the only portion of the coral reef is the uppermost uh, portion of the coral reef range that's exposed. So at low tide on a coastal coral reef, you may see the tops of the corals just sticking out of the water or just immediately under the surface. Um, but if uh, corals are completely uh, exposed to air, they're completely dried out without any uh, waves keeping them moist, uh, most corals will, will, will die back. Um, and you know, within a rocky intertidal zone, for example, uh, you'll see anemones, which are closely related to corals, and the anemones have to be, uh, they have to be kept moist. So anemones will thrive in a tide pool. Um, so the, the slide at the beginning of this, this is actually a, a picture of an anemone in a tide pool, and all of these uh, anemones are sort of uh, either open or curled up to sort of protect themselves. Uh, and this is in a little pool of water, that's within the rocky uh, uh, zone. So, um, uh, uh, you know, when, when corals are exposed, they have to do the same thing. They have to withdraw their, their tentacles uh, and pull them up and protect themselves. And if they completely dry out for any period of time, uh, that's, um, that's uh, fatal for them. So your question is very good because it gets to this question of range. So, um, uh, you know, organisms can tolerate a range of conditions, and corals can tolerate a certain level of exposure to air, but they can't completely dry out. So that defines the upper uh, limit of, of coral communities. And, you know, continuing with this idea, you know, it's a really excellent question because it draws out this, you know, if you think about what a coral community needs, uh, for corals that have zooxanthellae that are, are photosynthesizing, the lower end of their range is gonna be defined by uh, the availability of light to drive photosynthesis. So there, the coral reef range ranges from, goes from you know, depths of you know, 100 to 150 meters uh, when there's just barely enough light to support the photosynthesis all the way up to, this, to the surface, um, but you know, um, uh, deep enough so that they're never completely dried out. Okay? Okay, okay thanks. So, um, you know, we say that no species, and I think I've made this point previously, no species can exist without an ecosystem. There has to be a system of, uh, of uh, uh, non-living components, of energy, uh, and of living 
um, other living uh, organisms to allow a species to exist. Um, and so uh, a, a group of species living together is called a community, which is a human term with ecological meaning. Within a biological community, a marine community, no exception, each species performs a distinct function. And of course, um, the, the function that we talk about most are primary producers. Would, would somebody tell me if when I move the cursor across the screen, do you see that? Yes, we do. Yes. Thank you. Okay, good. It's good to know. Okay, so primary producers um, are the basis of the food chain. Of course, they're using light energy or in some cases chemical energy to make new organic carbon, which then moves through the food chain. Um, other examples are grazers, and so these are organisms that are eating uh, the, the uh, products of the primary producers. And um, primary producers uh, numerically outnumber um, uh, grazers in a marine community, but in terms of the biomass, the biomass is only a fraction. And in fact, as you go up in the marine food train, the biomass tends to increase. So if we think about uh, grazers, they tend to be smaller fish or organisms in a, in a marine community, whereas predators are often very large. Um, and so this is, this is a difference between um, uh, uh, marine communities and uh, uh, terrestrial communities. Think about that, um, you know, wolves and lions tend to be a lot smaller than, uh, and other predators tend to be smaller than their prey. Um, whereas in uh, the marine community, the top predators tend to be much larger than their prey. And then finally, uh, there are decomposers, and these are uh, these organisms perform a very uh, important function of breaking things down. Uh, decomposers are typically uh, microbial, although there are multicellular organisms that can uh, uh, facilitate decomposition. And finally, there are parasites, which don't do anybody any good, uh, but they are definitely a component of communities, and they tend to uh, provide uh, create stress on marine organisms. Okay, so um, you know, within a community, there are many different functions which are performed by different classes of organisms, and this is an example here of the different classes, generally speaking. So we talked about habitat, and so the habitat is the location within which a species can survive. Okay, and that's what we, the question earlier, uh, you know, brought that out as I explained, you know, the range of the habitat of corals. So the, the range that I described of corals living from a, the, the greatest depth at which there's still available light for photosynthesis all the way up to the top of the water column at low tide, that's the habitat for all coral reefs combined. But within that range, different species will have uh, a particular sub ranges where they are best adapted. So um, some corals like to be up where there's abundant light and they can tolerate, you know, occasional um, exposure to air. Other corals uh, are adapted to using different ranges of light and they like to live uh, deeper into the, in, in the water. So, um, um, you know, there's a location within the species uh, which can survive and part of that um, location includes the range of stresses that species are likely to encounter. Um, and, you know, this, this range, you know, we've talked about this range in terms of position in the water, um, but there's also uh, a vast range um, uh, of uh, geographic distance within which different conditions will be uh, encountered. And if we consider, for example, the humpback whale, which has a very, very broad range, um, it feeds in the Arctic. You know, the productivity in the Arctic is high enough uh, to support the very large biomass that uh, humpback whales obtain. But in order to reproduce, it has to breed and give birth uh, in the tropics. Uh, warmer water is necessary to help the offspring survive. So the total range of the humpback whale uh, is from the Arctic, uh, and particularly the Arctic where there's high uh, productivity overall of the, of the fish and other uh, um, uh, uh, organisms that it eats, 
humpback whales don't feed on plankton per se, but they eat small fish like herring and, and um, uh, other small fish. So they have to have those in large abundance to support their biomass. And they also uh, need these, uh, you know, the tropical temperatures in order to persist generation over generation. So in the case of the humpback whale uh, and other whales that have this broad range, um, you know, uh, if any portion of this range is becomes uh, no longer available uh, or the conditions change and don't support the needs of the species, that can put a stress on uh, the species uh, across its entire range. Um, so for example, you know, one of the issues in the Arctic right now for many whale species is that the Arctic is warming and it's become, seems to be becoming less productive of the kinds of foods which have, you know, through ecological history, supported whales. And so whales, uh, not just humpback whales, but other whales are uh, under stress because, um, you know, conditions have changed in a part of their range. So uh, right whales, for example, which are plankton feeding whales, are now at the edge of extinction because um, their habitat is no longer producing the same amount of plankton. And also uh, human activity is impinging, you know, boat traffic and so forth uh, tends to uh, uh, harm these right whales. So right whales, uh, ha although they, you know, their range still exists, it's become stressful in critical portions. And so that species is at risk. So in most communities, there are some organisms that create habitats for others. Um, and this example here, this shows, uh, this is an interesting kind of picture. This is uh, taken, this picture on the, on the right here is a mussel shell, it shows a mussel shell. And there's a little gastropod, um, and which is uh, crawling across the shell. Now what this gastropod does, this little snail, is it has radula and teeth, and it can um, scrape algae and, uh, and other detrital products off the surface of the shell. And so uh, mussel beds uh, tend to have, you know, sometimes hundreds or thousands of these tinier uh, gastropods um, that are living on the habitat created by the bed of mussels. And then here's a shrimp, and this shrimp makes a living by going around and uh, nipping off uh, little portions of the, the uh, it also browses, this particular shrimp, I, I'm sorry, this particular sh shrimp also browses um, uh, bacteria and uh, uh, detrital material. And then within this same community, there are other um, crabs that uh, make a living by um, uh, attacking the, the uh, gastropods and sometimes even attacking the muscles themselves. So uh, this is an example of the when you when you start concentrating one type of species, others come in and take advantage of the habitat that that species creates. And I'm sure you can think of other examples of how that works. So organisms uh, they alter the physical environment just by their presence, and they can also alter the chemical and even the thermal properties of the environment. And this modifies the habitat of other organisms. So this is a way in which the community works together. And you know, we talked about, we started about talking about the relationship between the primary producers and the secondary producers, but this is a, uh, a, a, a relationship between um, you know, organisms which may have different uh, levels in the food chain uh, that create, hab create habitat within their communities just by their presence. So here's an example of uh, modification of a habitat. Again, this is a picture taken from the uh, rocky intertidal zone, and I choose this because you have such a wide range. Now you can see that in, there are a series of depressions here, and these depressions are actually formed by anemones, which um, uh, you know wear away the rock, and so they they have little radula, little teeth-like things, and they also excrete acids, and they're able to uh, dig these burrows into this uh, carbonate rock, and so each one of these burrows was formed, you know, probably over multiple individuals, and becomes a habitat for these uh, anemones. But other organisms can also take advantage of the burrows that are formed. So other species can come in. Um, you know, these are this is a coralline algae uh, that's occupying, and there might be uh, mussels 
Uh, here are limpids um, that are moving across the, um, the habitat um, and they, they might take advantage. So you can see here, you know, how the activity of one organism is altering the physical environment and that alteration of the physical environment um, is something that uh, propagates uh, through the community and is part of the community if they've changed the physical environment. So that change is permanent. And we can think of many examples of that. Um, you know, woodpeckers that are pecking holes in trees that are then occupied by squirrels. Um, so, you know, there are many, many examples of this physical alteration. And you can see them very clearly in these intertidal examples. So um, this concept that we introduced, the concept of a niche, we define a niche as a multidimensional um, uh, description of how a species can survive. And uh, every species has a unique niche. So species and niches are you know, not interchangeable, but they're uh, related, they're dependent on each other. And um, you know, it's the exact linkage and the exact definition uh, of what the niche is and what the requirements of the species are may not always be clear. And there are many, many species where we don't completely understand uh, what they need, what their niche is. And sometimes we don't understand what their niche is until um, we've removed that niche in some way by human impact and the species goes extinct. So let's consider this. You know, uh, what does a species eat? Is it a carnivore or an herbivore? How does it obtain food? What environmental tolerances does it have? What eats it? What does it have to hide from? And you know the set of answers. You know what does it need to reproduce? You know what is uh, what are our special uh, adaptations? What are other needs that it has for nutrients or other things? And the set of answers to these sorts of questions is unique for each species. And you can see how that works. Now this is important. This understanding of the species. So when you have a fully um, uh, uh, stable community, what we call a climax community. That means that all the niches tend to be filled and there are species that are specialized for the different um, available niches. But let's consider a, a, a circumstance in which there are open niches. And we've talked about this before when we talked about Darwin's finches. Um, so if you have a, uh, an island, suppose an island forms because a volcano erupts. And so here's brand new land that comes up in the middle of the ocean. Well, the niches, um, the potential niches, uh, may not have, um, or probably will not have, uh, species to fill them. So, um, you know, there are no, when it first forms, there are no um, uh, species, and the species have to arise by, arise, or arrive by the process of colonization. So, in the case of the Galapagos Islands, um, the new islands opened up and there were no bird species. So when the species, uh, one, you know, one type of bird, in the case of the uh, famous case of the, Dar of the um, Galapagos Islands, finches, one species of finch arrived. And then that species, because it had many different ways uh, to make a living, uh, radiated and split into many other subspecies. Each of these subspecies specialized for some aspect of the environment that allowed it to survive. So this, this uh, question of uh, niche is absolutely fundamental to uh, evolution and to understanding of how species work. Um, you know, also because of community effects, the occurrence of a species or a niche often produces other niches and other species. In the case, and I showed you the example of this, in the case of the of the mussels that had little gastropods that were specialized for browsing um, material off the surface of the mussel shells. So, you know, as the community develops, the complexity increases as niches are created. Okay, so if you think about this new browser that is now living on the mussel shell, well, some predator might come along that's specialized for eating those browsers. Okay, so you see how this works. The other thing that we have to understand is that um, the physical, that the, every, every community, every uh, niche uh, 
comes with uh, uh, biological and physical stresses and uh, limitations. We talked about coral reefs and uh, intertidal zones, um, and those things uh, are the sort of create the boundary conditions within which a community or uh, can exist or within which within a community within which a particular species can survive. So um, different organisms have different tolerances for specific factors and an organism may be broadly adapted to different conditions or it may be narrowly focused. And so um, we can describe these sort of formally and scientifically with the prefixes steno and uro, uri. So a steno means narrow, and it is, can be used to describe organisms that have a narrow range of tolerances. And an example of this would be steno aline. You can probably figure out what this means. Steno means narrow, and aline refers to salinity. So a steno haline organism is one which tolerates a relatively narrow range of salinities. <coughs> Uri is a prefix that means wide, and it describes organisms that have wide tolerances for specific factors. For example, urethermal means an organism that can tolerate a wide range of temperatures. Now let's think about that. So if we have a, uh, an organism on an intertidal zone, which is sometimes underwater and sometimes exposed at low tide, um, you would think, what would you think? Would it be stenothermal or urethermal? Well, a little bit of thinking would suggest that, you know, when the, it's exposed to air and sunlight, the temperature is going to increase, and when the water comes back, the temperature is going to decrease, perhaps quite sharply. So an organism that lived in that particular niche would have to be uro, urethermal in its adaptations. I have a question about the Seno and Uri yes. um, tolerances. Does that relate at all to um, different kinds of species like the R and K species and how um, different kinds of animals um, can be classified as an R species or a K species? Like, does, do these two things go with that? I don't know if that makes sense. It does make sense. It's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have a perfect answer for that. Um, you know, R, K, R, and K, you know, are terms of, you know, how widely and rapidly does, um, uh, does it reproduce? Um, so, you know, a K strategy is, you know, a few, uh, 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 you know, producing few offspring, R is wide. So, you know, I would think that one of the one of the R uh, strategy uh, characteristics is to produce a wide range of offspring that may have different um, genetic tolerances. So there's a genetic range of within any species, and some organisms will tolerate high temperatures or low temperatures. So if you're producing many many um, uh, organisms, each each uh, haplotype. Would would then have uh, you know could then have a, a different uh, range of tolerances. So within that um, uh, you know reproductive uh, generation, um, you know there would be a good chance that it would you know one or the other of the individuals reproduced the offspring would have a chance of surviving. Um, so it's not I think. I think so. Then you know that certainly plays a factor in 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 R versus K uh, reproduction, but uh, that's not. It's a, it's a little bit uh, different from this uh, specific. This is a more general uh, definition of you know how we describe uh, ranges. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> another thing to think about is distribution patterns. And distribution patterns are really a key factor. And if we can, if we can map distribution patterns and describe them um, statistically and in, in terms of, um, you know, with, with a good accuracy, the distribution pattern can tell us something about the way, the niche of the organism, and also how it, relate, how it relates to other organisms in the community and other uh, members of its species. 
So let's consider three different distribution patterns, and these should be pretty clear. A random distribution pattern would suggest that the distance between from one individual to any other individual is a random function. In other words, um, you know, if you take a, a, a given individual, the, um, uh, the range from it to its nearest neighbor or its, its most distant neighbor is gonna be a random function with a normal distribution or possibly some other um, uh, statistical distribution pattern, um, but you would expect to see this random pattern. So, you know, finding one organism is not gonna tell you, you know, where you're gonna find another or how, how far you have to go to find another um, um, individual. In a clumped pattern, species tend to occur together. They tend to bunch up together. And uh, there can be a number of different reasons for this kind of clustering. Uh, in the example of mussel beds, um, species, the um, mussels uh, have to tolerate, you know, if mussels on a intertidal zone, they have to tolerate the wave energy coming in and hitting them. Uh, and so that's a real strand they also have to tolerate drying out. So mussels tend to cluster together because they attach to each other with, uh, they, they excrete what are called bissel threads. And these bissel threads are sort of like gluey little uh, threads that stick on to other individuals. Each, each muscle has, a, has a, a little gland, an organ that generates bissel threads. And the threads can spread out you know, over a fairly large area. So a muscle bed, they're all sort of tied together with this, this array of um, uh, bissus. And that allows them, that gives the overall um, a mass of muscle bed, the ability to withstand the, you know, the huge pounding that um, waves uh, can, can produce. So they need to be uh, clustered and clumped together, and you would expect to find them clumped. There are other reasons for uh, organisms clustering together. Um, you know, we, we, we often see, uh, uh, um, well, in, in, on land, you can see trees that tend to form clusters, um, and that's a pretty a common feature of live oak um, uh, groups and, and other features, uh, other, other tree species uh, across the Florida landscape. So clumping organisms that like to be together. A uniform distribution where there's a sort of a, a, a pretty predictable uh, range of differences, distances from one species, from one individual and species to the next, that tends to indicate uh, competition. Um, so you know, these species, this one is competing with that one, and, you know, they can't get any closer to each other, or, you know, the resources won't be there, or they'll physically attack, uh, you know, so that they try to distribute um, the, uh, the availability of, of material. And so, um, you know, forests, ecosystem forests tend to produce a, um, you know, a, a uniform spacing, you know, between trees, having to do with the size of the tree canopy. So uh, uniform, you know, has to do with competition for a limit, typically has to do with competition for uh, limited uh, resources. And, you know, if you go back to that picture that I showed, let's see, you know, here, you know, you could almost say that this is kind of a uniform pattern, um, you know, rather than a clumped pattern. Um, you, know, you know, this may be a cluster, you know, uh, on a larger scale, but at a smaller scale, you know, there tends, looks like this is kind of uniform, which would suggest that each individual has a specific range within which it's acquiring uh, resources. And if it clusters together too closely, um, you know, that may produce, uh, un you know, unsustainable competition. So each, each organism has got to have its own little um, burrow, uh, and burrows uh, can't, you know, overlap each other to too much, to too great a degree. Okay, so here's another way of describing this, you know, tolerance or, or you know, make, presenting a general picture of this idea of tolerance and density. So ideally, um, you know, uh, you would expect species density to reach a maximum where there, you know, where all the conditions uh, are, are most favorable. So uh, in this range here, in this idealized graph, we're suggesting that there is an optimal range of temperature for this particular species of, uh, of fish. So it likes it between you know, some range of temperatures. 
and where those ranges, where that uh, uh, range is, um, is optimal, you find the greatest density of organisms. Now, as you move away from this um, you know, central optimum, optimum uh, you, you, the stress begins to develop. So, uh, you know, as it gets colder, you know, fewer of these organisms can withstand, or fewer of these species can withstand this stress. And beyond, you know, the range here, they can't tolerate it. <clears throat> uh, likewise, as temperature increases. So you could put any, um, you know, environmental factor, most many environmental factors might, you know, uh, lie along this uh, x-axis here. So you could think of salinity, uh, availability of nutrients, availability of sunlight, uh, any env environmental factor or many, many different environmental factors, you know, can contribute to this um, uh, optimal range and create uh, stress or intolerance um, as the, the range is exceeded either from one end to the other. Can I ask a quick question about the muscles again? About the muscles? Yeah, um, when you're saying that muscles attach together by the bissel buds yes. um, for a reason like withstanding waves, is that the same with barnacles attaching onto um, like the sides of um, like in canals and all? Is that the same thing for barnacles? Well, it's a different, it's similar. I mean, uh, barnacles do tend to cluster together, but they are clustered, you know, by the optimality of their range, you know. So a barnacle has a, has a you know, a, a good substrate to attach to um, and a good availability of food from, you know, passing water. Um, but the individual barnacles are not dependent on each other the same way that the, the muscles are. So the muscles are actually, in the case of muscles bound together on a, on a rocky shore, they're actually depending on each other. And so the clustering allows, you know, more individuals to, uh, to bind together and for offspring to survive within that cluster. Um, whereas the, the barnacles, I think, is an example of clustering because of an optimal range of conditions. So you think about, you know, the, the barnacles have to be clustered onto a piling because Without that piling, there's no place for them to attach. And so that produces a clustering uh, because of this range description. So if you had a, you know, uh, a rope or something that wasn't as easy to attach to, um, they might very well, um, um, you know, have a, a not, be so, not be so dense in their, in their uh, clustering. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, you know any any factor or many many different factors can be described along this x-axis here, and you know the um, the y-axis is the number of individuals or the success of individuals over time. So here's an illustration, and I've got pictures of this. I'll I'll put them online and you know, to make this more available. Um, this is an example of the rocky inner tidal. So here's the high tide and here's the low tide. Uh, balanus are the mussels. Um, these are the um, uh, uh, anemones and are the um, uh, uh, grazing organisms. And uh, this is a competition. This is zone of competition. Okay, so here's, you know, so this is saying that mussels can exist across this whole range, and the. Um, uh, um, Forgetting the name of this organism. <laughs> Sorry, um, the uh, these uh, chitons uh, can um, can exist across this range, and you know um, within you know at the two margins, the two species are competing. And as you get deeper, you get outside the range of Catalmus, and uh, these are these are barnacles. Excuse me. So these are barnacles, and these are mussels. And so the barnacles um, uh, can live, um, you know, can tolerate more exposure uh, to water than the mussels can. Um, so the mussels are excluded uh, above a certain range, um, whereas the, uh, the uh, barnacles can't, you know, live as deeply in the water 
And so they're excluded below a certain range. So there's this competition there, and that makes the boundary between the two different species uh, kind of fuzzy. So this is an example of uh, competitive uh, interaction, and that has the effect of reducing the range of both uh, competitors. And so, you know, we understand this because we can scientifically, experimentally, we could remove one species or another. So if we removed all the barnacles from this picture, the mussels would expand into the uh, open range, and that can be done. And that's one of the you know sort of classic experiments uh, that people do in the rocky intertidal. Here's another example of stress intolerance um, from a very very different environment. And this is a, a hydrothermal vent zone, and this um, is a, a flange uh, chimney or flange. So what's happening? is it's a little hard to see but at the bottom of this picture there's hydrothermal fluid uh, being coming out this, this is at, at a depth of about um, uh, 25 2600 meters in the Juan de Fuca uh, uh, hydrothermal vent zone and so if you took a thermometer and put it in right here or a thermistor right here you would could record temperatures of in excess of 200 250 degrees Celsius. So this is extremely hot water that's coming out here. And then as you move further away, you still get temperatures and there can still be sort of turbulent eddies that will bring the temperatures up fairly high. And then as you get further and further up, the temperature range um, decreases. So there are a couple of different species on this living within this picture. So this is a mosaic. Um, and, the, and the distance here is not that gigantic. These are little worms, and each of the worms, you know, this is probably about five, six, you know, five to ten centimeters. And so each of these little um, calcareous uh, tubes here is the home of a, a single uh, worm. These are polychaetes called alvanelid polychaetes. So the way these alvanelid polychaetes make a living is they have tentacles. And the tentacles allow them to graze on bacteria, chemosynthetic bacteria. So there are abundant chemosynthetic bacteria that can tolerate the high uh, temperatures and can, um, by using chemosynthesis, um, they can use that chemical energy uh, to uh, produce biomass. So the primary producer in this ecosystem is our chemo are these uh, chemosynthetic bacteria. And there are other places where chemosynthetic bacteria live in this ecosystem, but these are the free living ones. And so these alvanelid worms uh, are you know, clearly able to tolerate high temperatures, but not too high temperatures. And you, what they do is they, um, they extend from their tubes and their tentacles will browse um, bacteria off the surface of the rock uh, as long uh, as the temperature is okay, but if there's a, within their tolerance range, but if there's a, um, uh, you know, something, a turbulent eddy or something that, that sends a, you know, a bundle of hot water that can retreat inside their tubes uh, to protect themselves. And so the environment for these organisms is kind of flickering between super, super hot, intolerably hot, and tolerably hot. And so these guys uh, can live within that range. Um, and it's kind of interesting because when they first discovered polychaetes, these, these albinal polychaetes, it was thought that, um, you know, that they were somehow able to survive temperatures in excess of 100 degrees. Well, you know, which shouldn't be the case. And in fact, it wasn't the case. Um, so they didn't, you know, um, what the way they survive is they, they, they stick their heads out, they stick their tentacles on, these are literally the heads, and they stick them out and browse, but then they're able to, to pull themselves back and protect themselves from high temperatures uh, if there's some kind of um, a blast of, of, hot, of hot water. So these are the alvanelid worms. And then further up, you have another species of polychaetes that are called paralvanelids that are, um, you know, have a, they're also able to tolerate high temperatures, but at a, um, you know, not, uh, not as high as the alvanelids. So alvanelids and paralvanelids are two species that have slightly different temperature ranges. Um, and then you can also see uh, tube worms. Um, this is a, an example of a tube worm here. 
and it's a little difficult. So here's a tube worm that has its tentacle extended. And so this is a, um, an organ that's adapted not for um, browsing bacteria, but for uh, taking up oxygen from the water. So this red color um, is a, um, uh, comes from a special he specialized hemoglobin that the tube worm has. And then you can also see, you know, densely within this, you know, some of these uh, little um, uh, gastropods, you know, that make a living within the overall habitat created by a combination. So the, the fundamental rock here, the fundamental mineral substrate is a um, polymetallic sulfide, which is precipitated from the, the, uh, the hydrothermal vent fluid. So the hydrothermal vent fluid comes out, it precipitates this little ledge, the hot water is trapped under this little ledge. Every once in a while, you know, it'll overflow uh, and create super hot temperatures at the edge. Bacteria, uh, you know, uh, are abundant uh, on this uh, surface, and then the uh, different uh, forms of worms are able to to tolerate to um, you know gra graze on the bacteria. And then there are also you know crabs uh, and some fish that um, are predators on the, the gastropods and the different worm species. Although this is a very stressful environment and predators tend to avoid it. So that's a niche that allows these organisms to exist. So adaptation to stress allows some species to live where similar species cannot. It reduces competition. And also uh, adaptation to stressful conditions can also confer some protection uh, from predators. So here's another example of environmental stress. This is again from the deep sea. These are pictures taken off the uh, Florida escarpment. At, this is um, uh, pictures that taken from the submarine Alvin. And during the, um, this particular dive of the submarine Alvin, the uh, submarine started at the base of the escarpment at about uh, uh, 3,000 meters water depth. And then it went up the, um, the escarpment along the way. And what was striking about this, uh, this dive was that most of the escarpment was um, unoccupied, you know, despite the fact that there's lots of hard substrate. So typically in the deep ocean, um, it's muddy bottom and where you have rocks and shipwrecks and hard substrates, um, corals and other sessile organisms will attach and make a living. But the stress in this environment, <coughs> <coughs> the stress in this environment came from the incredible uh, levels of sedimentation. So there's lots of sediment coming off of the surface of the, coming down from the, the land and sinking through the water. And that stress is such that it makes it difficult for most species to survive. This is an example of a, um, an octocoral. Uh, and this is uh, um, an octocoral that has this, the spiral pattern is quite striking. This is one of the few uh, animals encountered in this environment. But one place within this were the underside of ledges. So some places there would be underside of ledges um, where there was a protection from the uh, sediments. And you can see this sponge, this is a species of deep sea sponge. And the sponge um, is sort of, you know, uh, part of the sponge is being inundated by the sediments and it's, it's you know, can't survive, um, but, you know, a portion of the sponge colony is able to make it, you know, if it's protected. Um, and so, you know, where we would encounter, um, you know, abundant life on this, in this environment was um, on the underside of ledges and crevasses uh, that were protected from this high rate of sedimentation. So that's another example, two examples from the deep sea of this uh, kind of uh, uh, stress, environmental stress, and the way in which uh, tolerance to that environmental stress uh, or protection from those environmental stresses would create niches within which uh, organisms could, could survive. Okay, so we've talked uh, about li animals living together in communities, and we've talked about predation and uh, primary consumption. And we can codify all the different relationships uh, between organisms uh, if we think about species interactions. And that's what this uh, table uh, tries to show. Now this is, uh, you know, 
within each of these uh, descriptors, you know, there are many different ranges and it's sort of hard to define. It's kind of fuzzy, you know, how these things are, are, are defined. But if we look at what we can think about the interaction between one species and another species and broadly define it across, according to these different categories. So an example of nutri, nut, neutralism is where one species doesn't really have any effect on the other species, okay? So it's, a, it's neutral, there's no, it's not beneficial or uh, harmful for the two species to co-occur within the same uh, habitat, within the same uh, area. Um, you can also have a competitive uh, 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 interaction and that the example of that was between the uh, mussels uh, and the um, uh, 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 um, the mussels and the barnacles in that uh, diagram that I showed you. So another example would be inhibition, and so um, inhibition is where B inhibits A. So somehow or another. A, B is creating conditions that make it difficult uh, for A to, uh, to survive. So this is, um, you know, B doesn't care whether or not um, A is there, or doesn't, A, the presence of A has no direct effect on B because it's created conditions that inhibit the interaction of these two. Um, parasitism, um, you know, the, there's a, pre, a parasite and a, and a host. And so the parasite derives uh, benefit and the host um, you know, suffers some uh, loss. And, you know, the obvious example of parasitism that we all experience and are starting to experience more and more are mosquitoes and you know, their parasites, a uh, type of parasite um, that uh, is parasitic on human beings. Um, they get a little benefit every time they uh, take some of our blood and uh, we don't like it every time. Uh, of course, you know, mosquitoes in the range that we encounter them are tolerable, um, but parasites can be a big problem. Um, one of the problems facing uh, animals in changing conditions, uh, warming conditions, is that parasites uh, tend to be um, uh, inhibited by cold weather, for example. Um, so uh, if, it's, uh, if it's warm all the time uh, in uh, you know, in Canada, for example, uh, raising temperatures mean that, uh, you know, the ticks and the fleas that attack uh, moose and deer uh, become much more plentiful. Um, they're not um, uh, wiped out the way they are by cold water temperatures. And so um, this is posing a major restriction on, um, you know, those ungulates in that environment because of the changing conditions. Uh, predation is uh, similar to um, parasitism in that one species is eating another species. It's you know um, uh, pretty easy to think of you know how that interaction is always positive in one direction and negative in another direction. Uh, mutualism: both species are benefit and not it's not um, exclusive. So um, species can create conditions that help each other out. So there's um, both, um, both sides are going. Um, symbiosis, so, um, but um, in, in, a, in mutualism, there's benefit, but it's not mandatory benefit. That's different from symbiosis. So animal organisms can live together and they can benefit from having the presence of the other species, but that presence is not required. In symbiosis, that um, uh, there is a benefit, but both organisms need uh, each other. And in the, in the marine setting, an example of symbiosis is the relationship between uh, bacteria, which are able to conduct chemosynthesis, or chemoautotrophy, and um, their hosts, like tube worms or mussels. And in this case, the symbionts, the bacterial species, are adapted to the condition that the host creates, and uh, they really have, cannot or do not survive uh, independently. Likewise, if the host loses all of its symbionts, um, it tends to die. So that's an example in the, um, in the uh, chemosynthetic organisms. The same sorts of symbiosis is very important for 
uh, corals. So corals, uh, you know, uh, reef building corals have photosynthetic algae that are symbionts um, within them. And uh, bleaching is what happens, you know, is a, is a uh, event that occurs or a, a condition that occurs when temperatures exceed the range that the, that the um, host and the symbiote can tolerate. So when temperatures get high, corals reject their symbionts. And when they do so, they lose the color that, are, that the uh, symbionts provide. So the reason that uh, corals have bright colors is because they have these internal uh, uh, symbionts that are using pigments to, to conduct photosynthesis. Um, when the temperature goes up, the, these, uh, the zooxanthellae um, are excluded and the uh, remaining or coral organism becomes white in color because it's still alive, but it's lost its symbionts. And some corals can recover if they get their symbionts back, the symbionts die, um, but very often um, a, a bleaching event tends to kill corals, okay? So uh, mutualism, they, they like living together, both, both species derive a benefit, uh, but they can su uh, survive apart. Symbiosis, they uh, both receive a benefit and, they, and that benefit is obligate. They cannot uh, survive without that. You can also have an example of commensalism. And you can see commensalism every day uh, on the Florida State uh, campus looking at the live oak trees and the, um, uh, the ferns that grow on the branches of the live oak trees they're deriving a benefit from the live oak, and the live oak, you know, well, maybe it's having to carry extra weight, um, but it, it, it uh, has no effect. Um, so commensial, one uh, species is receiving a benefit, and the other species is, is not suffering anything, um, but is not necessarily directly benefiting. What kind of interaction is a lionfish, a, like invasive species, in, in um, like for example, the Gulf of Mexico with the lionfish? That's an example of competition. So the lionfish comes in and it, uh, it's a, uh, our strategy reproducer, it, it re reproduces very rapidly. And, uh, but unlike, other fish that are you know native to the Gulf of Mexico, um, it doesn't have any predators, okay? Because the you know uh, the, the fish haven't evolved to be able to eat lionfish, and the lionfish are protected with these poisonous spines, and so predators have a hard time eating them. Places where the lionfish is native, predators have you know figured out ways of attacking and and eating lionfish, um, so. You know, with the removal of the uh, predation pressure that other fish um, uh, that limits other fish, the uh, the lionfish has um, you know has a greater benefit. is able to outcompete the um, the native uh, fishes. So it's an example of competition, and you know the lionfish is winning because the um, the uh, native fishes. Uh, can't, uh, uh, you know, still are being eaten by predators, um, but have to compete for the uh, food sources that, that the, that the uh, lionfish would eat. So good question. Okay, um, <clears throat> so we've talked about, uh, you know, different um, assemblages of species. And, you know, we can describe species, uh, communities uh, with different terms. And so, um, uh, one of the terms uh, that describes species are, well, uh, um, uh, several terms are diversity, um, uh, richness, evenness, and dominance. So diversity is the, um, uh, the number of species within a community. So um, these two sort of cartoons illustrate two communities with the same 10 species. And um, uh, a measure of diversity is if we've selected groups at random from A and B, 
how long would we have to sample before we got all 10 um, species? So think about that question a little bit. Suppose we wanted to know all the species that live in this community. Well, this community happens to be do do dominated by elephants. So elephants are the dominant um, a member of this community and numerically. So there are many, many more element, elephants than there are any other species. This is all kind of made up, but it illustrates the, the, this, this concept here. So if we didn't really know, you know what was happening in this environment, if we, we didn't, didn't know how many species were there and we were just sampling at random, you know, with some kind of giant net, you know, this would work better for marine organisms because we can't actually collect with nets. We can't take, you know, nets to sample at random from this kind of community. But, you know, just bear with the example a little bit here. So if we were taking, uh, you know, samples of, you know, say nine species, three by three, and we were taking them at random within this array, in order to get to the, you know, to discover um, all 10 different species, we'd have to take many, many more samples from this community than we would from this community, okay? So um, this is, both these species uh, have similar richness, but the, this community here has a greater diversity. It's not dominated, um, it's more evenly distributed in abundance uh, compared to uh, example A, all right? Any questions about that concept? Okay, so, um, you know, if we have a community that's dominated by elephants, you know, in this make-believe example here, what happens if there's some disease that comes along and starts, you know, wiping out elephants? Not anything else, just elephants. Well, um, if it wipes out all the elephants, or most of the elements, elephants, this community is going to be changed very radically. And it's going to experience a lot more change than this community here, okay? So um, species with, um, you know, that are dominated by a single species, you know, have an inherent uh, instability if, if conditions change so that that particular species is under stress. Whereas species that have, uh, uh, you know, evenness uh, uh, in their diversity are, um, tend to be, can be more stable. Okay, here's some examples <coughs> of um, range and, uh, uh, and uh, adaptation. And this is taken from, this is a really interesting example. This was published, this is kind of a classic uh, paper. It was published in 1995. It's been cited by hundreds and hundreds of people. And it, it depends on really uh, historic data. So this guy here is Ed Ricketts. And I don't know if anybody's read um, uh, John Steinbeck's Cannery Row or um, Log in the uh, Sea of Cortez or um, uh, Tortilla Flat. Uh, these are a whole series of books that uh, John Steinbeck wrote about uh, Monterey, California. And uh, one of the characters in his books was a guy he called Doc. And that was based on a real uh, person, Ed Ricketts. And Ed Ricketts um, lived in Monterey, and he had a business collecting specimens for laboratories. And so he would go out uh, with a boat and collect um, you know, nets and wade around in the water with a, with a net. And uh, uh, he would collect uh, specimens that he then sold to laboratories and schools and so forth. And that was how he made his living. Well, he kept very, very careful notes. You know, he wasn't just making money. He was also a real, you know, uh, somebody who really, a naturalist, what we would call a naturalist. And so he kept very, very careful notes of the abundance of different species um, and where he caught them, how far he had to go up or down the coast. Okay, I guess I'm running over time. Um, so the, um, the, the point here is that uh, if we compare um, the, uh, the range of organisms uh, over time, you know, people, uh, we can see the effects of climate change. And so um, uh, climate change is showing that uh, the density is, uh, is, is changing with respect to 
um, uh, how far along you are. And let me skip past that. I wanted to get to one other concept, which is uh, growth and carrying capacity. Um, you know, this is where this environmental uh, resistance starts kicking in. So for any given species, it tends to increase very rapidly until it reaches some level where there's some stress that starts to affect it. Uh, let's see. I think, I guess I'm out of time. I'll have to stop there. And uh, I'll put the rest of these slides online and I'll record this. And so I'm gonna end the lecture here. Uh, and um, uh, I guess I went a little bit over because we spent time in the beginning. This will be online and I'll put a, a, a uh, quiz on there. So before I go, has anybody got any questions or anything? Um, I do have a question. Um, I was just thinking about the corals and their uh, the organisms that act as a symbiotic uh, with a symbiotic relationship to them. And you were talking about how algae, um, how algae and coral are in a symbiotic relationship. But what happens with like eutrophication and stuff, where algae actually over um, overcompetes these corals, but they're in a symbiotic relationship. So wouldn't you say that the more algal blooms you have, the better effect corals would prosper, but it's actually the opposite. Okay, well, there's an important point, an important distinction to make. So there are different kinds of algae and, um, and the organisms that live in the um, uh, corals are not the same as the free living algae that form you know nets and you know these sort of web like um, features that we see when algae are blooming or when there's mm -hmm. um, or you know so those algae are actually um, uh, you know free living whereas the symbionts of the coral live internally inside the uh, uh, cylinderate the, the coral organism the one that makes mm -hmm. the the uh, coral skeleton and uh, so they're different from, you know, from the algae that are free living. And in fact, corals and algae are in competition. And um, one of the things that limits the availability of algae is that algae grow on corals. And then there are many fish and other grazing organisms uh, uh, that will come and graze and eat the algae. And so the existence of these other organisms grazing down the algae allows the corals to outcompete the mm -hmm. algae. Um, and you know the other thing that tends to limit the growth of algae is the availability of nutrients. And so typically corals live in a low nutrient environment. So nutrient availability is also limiting the uh, growth of algae. Uh, one of the things that happens if you eutrophy a system, you put more uh, nutrients in there, is that the algae are able to reproduce at a greater rate, and they tend to outcompete the corals. And so that's a problem on many reefs, you know, where particularly where there's sewage outfall or other sorts of other sources uh, of nutrient eutrophication um, that can do that. That's also a problem in places where overfishing or other um, uh, events have limited the number of grazing or organisms that would keep the algae under control. Okay, so that's a good question. All right, any other questions before I leave this? Um, I just have a question about the uh, attendance for these lectures. Um, yes. A certain way that you're gonna do it or? Um, yeah, I get a record. That's why I had you all register. So I'll get a record of, of who attended. Um, <laughs> And you know, if you have to leave before the lecture is over or something happens, you know, as long as you sign in at some point, I'll know that you attended. Um, and that'll be, you know, attendance in the lectures. You know, like I say, I've broadened the grade range. And what I'm looking for is is everybody to keep going as best we can and get in here. So I'm not going to like give you points for the attendance, but they're definitely going to help um, uh, as as you know. I look at uh, you know who who you know who's participating in the class and who's sticking with it right. okay and also did you send us the youtube uh channel that you were going to post these lectures on 
Uh, no, I'll send you a YouTube link because I have to convert this and mm -hmm. it takes like, actually I'll probably take a half an hour to convert this uh, okay. to, and the file will be like, you know, 500 megabytes or something like right, that. Right. So that's going to take me a while to convert and upload, but I'll do it and I'll okay. put it up there. Okay. All right. Um, All right, I'm going to stop recording and I'll say goodbye and uh, um, you can always email me and we'll see you again Thursday. Bye now.